Well, good morning. We'll get started. It's still morning, I guess. It feels like it's afternoon with the temperatures outside. Welcome to summer in Moab. And welcome also to the celebration of life for Eleanor Dotson. I know some of you guys have been waiting some time for this, and it's, it's finally here. So welcome. Um, we're going to keep this uh, a celebration of life, uh, remembering the, the good times with Eleanor and looking towards our, our Christian hope today. So please join me with, in prayer as we get started. Lord, we, we come here because we are your people. We're your children who've been invited to, to come boldly uh, before your throne and bring our, our hearts, bring our hopes, bring our desires, bring our needs to you. And Lord, we, we come to do that, but we also bring our praise. Lord, thank you for the faithfulness that you have given us as, as a human race for uh, hundreds and hundreds of years. Lord, you have been working this great redemptive plan and Lord, we get to cherish it, we get to, to uh, take possession of it, we get to, to sing to you about it, we get to take it to our hearts and find comfort and encouragement in difficult times. Lord, we thank you for this family that's able to, to gather together today, maybe even some that are watching online. Lord, we pray that you would be ministering to the needs that they have, that you would be touching their hearts, that you would... Uh, help them to, to feel your love, but to know your truth as well. Lord, we thank you for Eleanor and the time that each one here got to spend with her, uh, the, what she meant to them. Lord, we, we thank you for those kind of people in our lives. And uh, Lord, just ask that you would help to, to heal the wounds of, of loss um, after she passes to you. But Lord, we, we thank you so much for this opportunity. We just ask your blessing over this time in Jesus' name. Amen. All right, if you have a program, um, we have a scripture reading from Hunter. Hunter would like to come up. Hi, everybody. Thanks for coming out. Um, bear with me. I'm not the best public speaker, and I'm really nervous, but I couldn't, I couldn't say no to being involved, and couldn't turn down my grandma. So um, I'm just up here to read a scripture, which is going to be John 14, 1 through 6. And it starts out, Do not let your hearts be troubled. You believe in God. Believe also in me. My Father's house has many rooms. If that were not so, would I have told you that I am going there to prepare a place for you? And if I go and prepare a place for you, I will come back and take you to be with me, that you also may be where I am. You know the, the place, you, you know the place to the place where I am going. Thomas said to him, Lord, we don't know where you are going, so how can we know the way? To which Jesus answered, I am the way and the truth and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. Thank you. Okay, we invite the praise team to, to come up and we'll sing a, a couple of praise songs. I'd like to take this just a moment to say thank you to Janet and Mac for the honor of allowing us to be here and join them in the family. We, um, it's just time of celebration. I remember Eleanor mostly by we'd go out to Mac and Janet's house and for dinner, and she would sit there and visit with us with that sweet smile on her face. And I kind of wondered if she was thinking, you know, if you'd shut up, maybe we could eat dinner now. <laughs> This first song, Trading My Sorrows, we 
can all if care to sing with us. It's our tradition here to just open up with good songs. Nothing else can take your place. 
like to invite Duke up to read the obituary. I'm going to be reading the obituary. I just wanted to comment on that picture. I was just That's grandma to a T, and she's doing that same smile looking down on all you guys today. Eleanor Jean Dotson, 96, passed away peacefully on March 27th, 2022, at her daughter's home in Bullshead City, Arizona. Eleanor was born September 9th, 1925, in Dayton, Pennsylvania, to parents Elmer Roy Powell and Edna Ruby Barrett Powell. She had three brothers, Donald, William, and Richard. Eleanor graduated from Dayton Vocational High School in Daytona, or Dayton, Pennsylvania, in 1943. After high school, she served as a cadet nurse during World War II. From 1946 to 1947, she went and was enrolled at the Hospital School of Nursing in Indiana, Pennsylvania, where she earned her registered nursing degree. She practiced as an RN in both Cody and Riverton, Wyoming, Ogden, Utah, and Mount Vernon, Washington. On December 4th, 1945, Eleanor married the love of her life, Theodore Ted Dotson Jr. They were soulmates for over 70 years and together raised four children, Jean Lee Burley of Bullhead City, Arizona, Jim Linda of Casper, Wyoming, Janet Mack McLean of Moab, Utah, and Ken Sandy of West Jordan, Utah. In addition to raising four children who all successfully earned college degrees, they had nine grandchildren, 15 great-grandchildren, and three great-great-grandchildren. Eleanor enjoyed traveling with her family, visiting many of the national parks and attending two world fairs. She loved living in the Moab, Utah area with her daughter Janet and husband Mac. She was a pro at word search games and enjoyed the solitude of Mother Nature. She was a member of the Community Church of Moab and United Methodist Church, where she served as a Sunday school teacher and a member of the Methodist Women's Society. Eleanor was a Girl Scout leader and a former member of the Rebecca Lodge. Eleanor was preceded in death by her parents, her husband Ted, and her brother Donald. She is survived by her children, grandchildren, great-grandchildren, and great-great-grandchildren. Thanks, Duke. Now we'd like to have Janet come up, if you're able. Well, good morning, everybody. It's nice to see you. Just bear with me, okay? I'll do the best I can. My mom, Eleanor Jean Powell Dodson, was a very kind, sweet lady. She was very easy to talk to. You could talk to her about anything. Growing up, my friends loved to hang out at our house and talk to my mom. They always called her Ellie. No one else called her Ellie. I don't know if my siblings, if their friends called mom Ellie, but my friends all called her Ellie. And I think it was just them. But when we were growing up, our family traveled a lot. Every other summer, we drove back to Pennsylvania to visit family. We went to several world's fairs went back when they used to have those. We went camping quite a bit too, and we had some good quality family time. Mom was a registered nurse. I remember her always working the graveyard shift so that she would be home when we got home from school. That's a good mom. She worked at hospitals and a nursing home. She always told us she never ever wanted to be put in a nursing home. Well, we at least got to keep that wish for her. I'll never forget the time she took me to the nursing home to get a haircut. There was a full-time beautician that took care of the resident's hair there. Well, she gave me a haircut all right, the shortest haircut I've ever had. Well, until now, <laughs> that is. I cried and cried and so did my mom. She was quite mad. She said, we'd never let that lady cut my hair again, and she didn't. You know, mom was pretty smart. 
early in her marriage to dad, she did a really smart thing. Whenever they went to family gatherings, they, of course, would take something to share. Dad's family always praised my dad for what the, a great job he did cooking whatever they brought. Even if mom had prepared it, dad always got the credit. So she kind of got tired of hearing that. So she told my dad, well, since they think you do all the cooking, you're going to do all the cooking. And so dad did all the cooking. And that was okay, good for her. I wish I had done that, or Mac. <laughs> Mac's pretty good, he helps, but you know, he doesn't do all the cooking, that's for sure. When I was growing up, I always seemed to have a hamster or a gerbil as a pet. Now, having a dad who grew up in that era when they could do everything, you know, they could wire a house, they could plumb a house, they could build a house, they could fix a car, they did everything from that era. Well, my parents wouldn't buy me a cage for my hamster because why would we buy one? My dad could make one. Use a little chicken wire, a little bit of wood, build a hamster cage. Well, great. Well, the last hamster I had kind of chewed and chewed and chewed until it gained its freedom right out of that cage. Well, we searched our house and searched our house for that hamster and um, we ha saw evidence of the hamster but could not find that hamster. We saw that he had built a nest in a roll of paper towels under the kitchen sink, but we could not find him until one morning. All of a sudden, we hear a scream from my mom's bedroom. We run in there, and sitting in the bed next to my mother was the hamster. Well, needless to say, guess what I got that day? A store-bought hamster cage. <laughs> so, but I, and it didn't have any wood in it, so it was no freedom for that hamster. I think that was the last hamster I ever had. Um, one thing that mom was always very proud of was her kids. There are four of us, and she loved to tell everyone that all four of her children were college graduates. She was a proud mama. All four of those wonderful children went together at Christmas time and bought mom and dad a puppy. It was probably the best gift we ever gave them. Her name was Pepper. Now, Pepper lived to be 16 years old, and she just passed away this past year. Well, she gave them a tremendous amount of joy. There was only one problem, though. Pepper loved to beg from the table, and she was relentless. She would sit and beg and bark and carry on forever. And it was my mom and dad were both really bad at feeding Pepper from the table, so that didn't help anything. Um, after dad passed away, we put a sign on the kitchen table to remind mom, do not feed Pepper from the table. Right in front of her. And we'd point at it, remember mom, don't feed Pepper from the table. Well, mom knew exactly what she was doing. She would grab a little piece of food. She, and she kind of sat, there's Mac, mom, and me. So she sat between us. She would look at Mac, look at me, make me give Pepper a piece of food. And we, if we said anything, she looked at us like, I didn't give her any food. It's like, Mom, remember, don't feed Pepper. I don't feed Pepper from the table. Right. Right. We know that wasn't true. Let's see. Well, Mom lived with us for 11 years, but we had a lot of help during those years. My sister Jean and her family took Mom every summer for a month or two to give Mac and I a break. Then, during this past year and a half, they had Mom almost full time while I was going through all my treatments. And we will be forever grateful to them. My brother Jim, he came to Moab many times to stay with mom and the dogs, while Mac and I went on a vacation, <laughs> or had surgery. But, and my brother Ken, he spent time with mom while we were off doing something productive, I'm sure. Then there are my friends like Gail and Amy. They would come over and check on mom while we ran to Grand Junction or Salt Lake. I'll never forget the time Mom took a fall during the weekend of Mac's 50th class reunion. 
Well, now Mac has spent a year planning this reunion, right? He has worked really hard over that time. It was the last day of the reunion. There was a large group of people hanging out at our house, and we were getting ready to go out to Red Cliffs for the final banquet. Um, I went in the house to check on Mom. Well, she had fallen in her TV room and was blocking the doorway. So you couldn't get in to get to her. But I finally squeezed through and got her moved from the door. Well, we decided we better have her checked out, so we called the EMTs and we got her to the hospital. And, but it was getting time to head to Red Cliffs for the banquet. I'm at the hospital waiting for x-ray results and waiting, and I'm, and I'm in charge of showing a video at the reunion that I've worked on for months and spent a lot of time on. So in a panic, I give Gail a call. Being a wonderful friend that she is, she came right over to the hospital. She stayed with my mom, took my mom home when they found nothing was broken, and stayed with her until we got home. We, what would we have done without such great friends and family that helped all these years? Mom took some other falls during her time with us. She fell, heading out of the house on her way to church, and hit her head hard, like really hard. She had to be taken to Grand Junction to the ICU because she had a brain bleed. And then Amy came with me to Junction for that one. Then Mom fell and broke her femur. She had a rod put in her femur and had to be non-weight-bearing for seven weeks. Well, she had to surgery and junction, and then she spent seven weeks at the Moab Regional Hospital. She was one tough lady. Besides all these things, she had both knees replaced, both hips replaced, cornea transplant surgery in both eyes, along with many other surgeries during her lifetime. She was a real trooper. She hated to use a walker because that was for old people, even though she's 96. Come on, Mom. I consider you old. Mom loved to go for drives, even if we took her to the same place over and over. She was a master at doing word searches. She went through a lot of word search books. She watched Judge Judy and Fox News. Her short-term memory was gone, so she could watch the news all day long and have no clue what was going on. Now, Dr. Munger had us try a medication that was to slow the progression of her memory loss. Well, when she started the new, taking the new medicine, it was kind of funny. She would ask me every time for weeks, now, what is this pill for? Your memory. My memory, yeah. Now, now what is this pill for? Your memory. I don't think it did much good. <laughs> but mom was great. She always got dressed on her own, would never just wear pajamas around the house or stay in bed all day. I do those things sometimes. She never did that. She always helped me with dishes after dinner. She would offer to set the table for dinner, but would only give herself silverware. We don't know where that came from, but she set the table and gave herself silverware, and we didn't get any. Oh, well. She loved to sit in the backyard and just watch the birds and watch Mother Nature. She loved her M&Ms. She went through a, probably a family size bag about two weeks, every two weeks or less. And she loved the Utah Jazz. The eye doctors were always amazed at her because she wore hard contact lenses until her passing. Who does that? Who wears hard contacts at 96? The eye doctors were amazed. The only problem with that was she lost a lot of contacts. We spent many hours searching for contacts. I had this little suction cup, I mean, it's like this big, that I could use to remove the contacts from her eye that she swore that the contact was still in her eye, although I couldn't see it. Let me tell you, when that suction cup latched onto her eye, with no contact between. It wasn't funny trying to get that suction cup unstuck from her eye without pulling her eyeball right out of her socket. I'm like, oh, Mom, there's no contact in here, but I've got your eye. It was, it was terrible. But, and there was a time that Terry 
he took apart the sink when she had lost a contact because we swore it had to gone down the sink and we found one. I don't know if it was the one she had just lost, but we found one down the sink, which saved us $100. Then I just found cleaning out the bathroom and getting rid of some stuff. I found two more contacts laying in the bathroom, in the drawer in the bathroom. So we went through a lot of contacts. But still, it was pretty cool she could take them out and put them in herself. When a mom got where she would get confused, especially in the evenings, so we gave her a list of answers to questions that she always asked. The list had things like, I have your pills, we're in Moab, Mac and Janet are married, they've been married for 36, 38 years. Sometimes she would tell me, it wasn't, it was time for my boyfriend to go home. Um, he couldn't spend the night, he needed to go home. And I'm like, Mom, we've been married 38 years. You didn't invite me to the wedding. There's no way you were married. So, you know, it, that was always tough. So we had to get her to bed first so that, you know, Matt could stay home. <laughs> so that was always one of my favorites. But Mom kept us on our toes. We wouldn't trade anything to having spent all those years with her at our home. We have lots of wonderful memories, and we'll really miss her. And I want to thank the praise team. That's very special, you guys. And Tammy for singing. And the deaconesses for lunch. And just appreciate all of you so much. And my niece, Jill, would like to say a few words. And there you go. I made it. <laughs> made a tough follow-up so I'm not on the program if you all noticed um, I just uh, feel like as a granddaughter that I need to say just a few things I don't have anything planned so bear with me this is kind of one of those things that if I didn't get up and say something I'll probably regret it the rest of my life and I don't want to regret have any regrets. Um, so first of all, 96, wow, um, amazing, absolutely amazing, right? 96 years. Um, she was uh, my last grandparent, my last grandparent to pass. Uh, <laughs> I, uh, Janet hit on a couple things that are just uh, and one of my biggest things is she loved to visit. She loved to visit. Um, you would come and uh, even before she was older and before, even when I was little, I remember grandma always wanted to sit down at the table and talk, sit down and just visit. Um, I think that was probably one of her favorite things to do was to just sit and visit with everyone and catch up with us all. and. Um, I remember uh, one time when I was younger, Grandma and Grandpa were living out in uh, California, and they had this new little puppy, Tiffany, and uh, she was a wild little, she was a Maltese poodle, she was a wild little white thing, and my brother and I were chasing her up and down the yard the whole time, and um, this on... I'll get to Tiffany in one second, but real quick. We were sitting at the counter what that, when we were there that visit, I remember, and Grandpa was trying to feed me cantaloupe. And um, I hate cantaloupe. <laughs> uh, but Grandpa was being pretty insistent that I needed to eat my cantaloupe. And um, for all anybody that knows my Grandpa, you know his sense of humor and how Grandpa can be. Um, but Grandma stuck up for me. <laughs> <laughs> and um, I think that's probably one of the things um, I'll always remember. And I think if you all, all of you that know her, and you think real, think real hard, you may not have to think hard about it. But um, Grandpa making his wise crack jokes at everybody and giving everyone a hard time, and I can still right now I can hear Grandma saying, "Oh, Ted," and um, that was kind of a 
So, um, a catchphrase is a poor word right now. I just can't think of it, but that's how I can hear her is just always saying, oh, Ted, you know, just to kind of let us know um, that he was joking, which we've all developed the <laughs> that sense of humor, I think. Um, and uh, the strength. Um, she was one strong, strong lady, someone that I admired, I think, uh, as far as strength goes, that's where I've learned to have a lot of strength. I did get that from her. My curly hair, my daughter was blessed with that beautiful curly hair too. Thank you, Grandma. Um, it's a pain and a blessing all at one time, right? Um, and the strength, all the surgeries, the hip replacements, the knee replacements, and I just have to laugh because I did just find out recently that I'm 44 years old and I get to have a partial knee replacement here soon. So I like to say thanks, Grandma. <laughs> thanks for the hips and thanks for the knees. But you know what? I'll take anything I can from her. So um, I think that's just the biggest in, in that her laugh and that smile. Um, and so if you have that ability and, and you knew grandma, I just encourage you to remember that voice, um, that laugh and that, oh, Ted, voice. So, um, and Aunt Janet and Uncle Mac um, and Jean and Lee and fam everybody, I mean, you guys are amazing kids to her, uh, to to do what you did to keep her that one wish that's a big thing you know I mean Janet you said it was just you know one small no it was so big so huge to keep her and keep her home you guys are amazing kids and you learned it from an amazing mom and amazing parents and I'm very grateful that you're my father and my aunts and uncles and um just stay strong and I hope the family just continues to be as strong and close as we always are. All right, thank you. You've heard some stories. Now we have a, a video uh, slideshow put together so you can see some of the, the pictures. I think you'll enjoy this.
up that's where you find me somewhere over the rainbow way up high. Yes, Diana put that together. That's excellent. Good job. Um, we have a musical tribute. We'd like to have Tammy come up and sing. stayed a little longer, held on a little tighter, now what I'd give for one more day with you. Cause there's a wound here in my heart where something's missing, and they tell me that it's gonna heal in time, but I know
Thank you, Tammy. Now you get the pastoral reflection. <laughs> I was looking at, at different verses, different things to, to maybe present. There's just so much in Scripture um, to, to look at in these kinds of situations. And, you know, one of the, the verses that's most mysterious, I think, in, in Scripture is from Psalm 116. And it, it's so nice reading through the Scriptures. You, you just don't miss stuff. You can't, you can't skip it. So Psalm 116 has one of the most surprising verses in Scripture, at least for those that might not you know, know God's wisdom and, and God's character. But in verse 15, the psalm says, precious in the sight of the Lord is the death of his saints. Precious. Valuable, rare, costly, glorious, highly prized, highly valued. The interesting thing is it's not the lives of the saints that God thinks is precious. It's something different. It's the death of his saints that he finds precious. Now, I'd be probably safe to say that very few of us, if ever, think that death is a good thing. Yet the God of all wisdom, the God of all knowledge and understanding looks at death, especially the death of his people, and treats it like a valuable prize. Greater than diamonds, greater than gold, greater than silver, greater than any other prized possession. So what does God see that we tend to miss? What does God see in the in the death of his saints that we miss. And I would maybe sum it up in one word and just say victory. Victory. God sees victory, not defeat. God sees victory in death. These can be a great victory if a loved one is a saint. How we view death depends on how the deceased was connected to God. Makes all the difference. Eleanor was connected to God. With that truth, then we can look at some, a lot of other passages and see some encouraging things. So I'm going to share from 1 Thessalonians chapter 4, verses 13 to 18. And we're going to see four uh, truths, four encouraging elements. Starting verse 13, brothers and sisters, we do not want you to be uninformed about those who sleep in death, so that you do not grieve like the rest of mankind who have no hope. For we believe that Jesus died and rose again, and so we believe that God will bring with Jesus those who have fallen asleep in him. According to the Lord's word, we tell you, that we who are still alive, who are left until the coming of the Lord, will certainly not precede those who have fallen asleep. For the Lord himself will come down from heaven with a loud command, with the voice of the archangel, and with the trumpet call of God, and the dead in Christ will rise first. After that, we who are still alive and are left will be caught up together with him in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air. And so we will be with the Lord forever. And then he says, therefore, encourage one another with these words. So I'm here in this part of the, the service to just encourage you with these words. We can view death very differently from the rest of humankind. This makes us grieve differently than the rest. Because unlike the rest, we have hope in death. There's four comforts in this verse, four encouragements. The first encouraging news is how Paul refers to death. Did you catch that in the passage? It's just sleep. He uses a euphemism for death, but he uses it right next to the word death to emphasize that 
Sleeping in, in death suggests something else, something more. It suggests that death is temporary, maybe even something good for us. If not good, then at least necessary. You know, as a child, I thought bedtime was probably the worst part of the day, right? Or nap time, you remember? That might be a little long to remember, but, you know, there was probably a time when it was like, hey, you, you need to take a nap, and you probably had a fit and said, no, I'm going to miss out on something. But it was good for us. As an adult, you probably say, man, I can't wait to go to bed. It is nap time, right? Your perspective can change because you recognize maybe the good that is in it. Part of Christian grieving is seeing the possibility of the good in our losses. But there's more. There's also the idea of hope. We have a reason to hope, even in death. We can call death sleep, and we can hope when others pass because of Jesus. Our attitudes are based on a historical fact. Jesus died, and Jesus rose. This is the basis of our hope. This is the basis of who we are as God's people. This is the historical event and our trust in it that makes us saints. Since we hold this belief as what really happened, it leads us to a related belief. God will bring those who have fallen asleep with Jesus when he returns. The Lord will bring those who have passed in him, with him. Loved ones like Eleanor, who precede us in death, will not be left out. I think that was the reason for this response, this letter. You know, people had lost loved ones, and they're like, well, we're waiting for Jesus. What's going to happen to them? And Paul, Paul's like, don't, don't worry about them. They're going to come with him. They're going to be there. They're not going to be left out. Jesus will come on the command of the archangel. At God's trumpet sound, and guess what happens first? Eleanor and the dead in Christ will rise first. Then the living will be brought together with them to meet them in the air, and this is the third comfort. We will be with them together. Reunited with the deceased loved ones in Jesus as he returns. The scriptures teach that we will join Christ and his saints in a glorious parade arriving back here in victory. Death, it turns out, is just a temporary part of the story, it's a rest for our bodies. It's a rest we get until Christ's time comes. And after that, we have the fourth comfort. This is where Paul brings us, and he says, then we will be with the Lord forever. Together and alive with Jesus, never to experience death again. Paul intended for us to keep encouraging one another with these exact words. This more complete picture with its four encouragements explains why the Lord considers the death of his saints a precious thing. It's because they are one, W-O-N. They are one by him, but also because they are one, O-N-E, united in him. When that happens, nothing will ever change that truth. This is why we can see hope in the midst of these circumstances and sing praises in our grief. 
why we trade our sorrows and especially say at these moments how great is our God. Please pray with me. Lord, just could we come before you with this hope in death that, Lord, it is momentary. It's a season in a longer eternal life. Lord, I just ask that you would bless this family, these friends, those who are experiencing a hole in their heart. Lord, fill it with you and your hope and your love, the peace that you want to give them. We pray that each one will draw closer to you in the midst of this and see your glory. And Lord, taste your victory. Lord, thank you for what you have accomplished in our Lord Jesus. Send your Holy Spirit to lead us into his truth. We pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen. I'll invite the praise team to come back up. Lead us in some more praise. This, this next song is, is the belief. The, you hold this hope now and, and when you go to meet the Lord, I invite you to sing it with us.
We invite you over to the fellowship hall right now for, for lunch. I think the ladies have it all prepared, and then we'll go to the graveside um, following that, maybe 1.30-ish or something, depending on, on how lunch goes. But Let me cl close our time in prayer. Uh, Lord, we just want to confess we love you. We trust you. Um, that changes everything. Uh, Lord, just ask that you would bless this family as we, we move over to the luncheon. We pray that you would bless the food and those who have provided and prepared it. Uh, Lord, we thank you for them. But Lord, thank you for this, this time uh, to worship you, but also to remember your, your servant, Eleanor, and, and celebrate the time and, and the love that each one here has experienced with her. But Lord, we, we pray that you would continue to do your work. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. All right. You can go out the back doors or you can actually go out the side doors and, and head in. They should be ready for us.